podcasts and wikis and blogs. Oh my, e-learning's not in Kansas anymore. Well, then where is it? Perhaps it's here in the KD program. Hopefully, that's where it resides. How many of you have done a podcast? How many of you have been involved in a wiki of some kind or maybe helped with Wikipedia? And do any of you have your own personal blog? Do you update it if you, in fact, do have one? My name is Kurt Bonk. I'll be the host for this session on podcast wikis and blogs, and we'll walk through what's going on in each of those three areas. But keep in mind, as we go through these three areas, it's not necessarily these three technologies that matter. What matters is the change or shift that's occurring as a result of many types of technologies and pedagogies hand in hand. It's both nature, the technologies, and what they enable us to do, and nurture, the pedagogies that you embed within your classes that, in fact, impact on what learning happens there as a result. But again, it's not these three technologies because we've been inundated with technology after technology over the past couple of decades. What three technologies I might talk about a year from now, two, five years from now, again, might be important to you at the time, but it's the shift that's happening to give students more responsibility for their own learning. There's a shift that's happening from teacher-centered learning towards more learner-centered learning, a shift that's happening from solitary learning towards collaborative learning, a shift that's happening from formalistic learning experiences towards informal ones, a shift that's happening from tried and true pre-prescribed contents and curricula towards experiential, authentic, real-world relevant information that students have to weed through, digest, make sense of, and problem solve on. A shift that's happening across all of our classes, whether we're teaching in face-to-face -face settings, whether we're teaching in fully online ones, whether we're teaching in a blended experience. It's a shift that's happening not only here in Indiana, in KD, but in many programs at IU, at other institutions, and around the world. We're off to see what's going to happen, right? We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. The wonderful wizard of Oz. There was. Well. We'll be walking through many of these little clips here today from the Wizard of Oz. Hello? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, Toto and Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. E-learning's not in Kansas anymore either, is it? No, it's alive and well here in Indiana and at other places around the world. I, in fact, went to the Kansas websites. I'll show you here in a second. Take a look at what I found in Kansas in terms of e-learning. Kansas, that little state that exists to the west of us. I've never been to Kansas, one of the few states I've not been to and I hope to get to someday. I went to their website to check out Kansas. It's a great little state as I found. Wonderful pictures and so forth. It's a twister! It's a twister! Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Have a nice little governor there. Well, I went to the governor's website, entered link to chat, and I asked her what's happened to e-learning within Kansas. And I didn't get a response. I went to websites on e-learning, e-learning design here, and what I get, page cannot be found. Has all the e-learning left Kansas and gone to other places? I went to the chat there, Kansas chat with the governor. She wouldn't respond to me when I asked her what's going on. Actually, I have, they actually do have this chat site, so you can talk to the governor. I wrote to her message saying, I've got to do a talk about podcast wikis and blogs. Oh my, e-learning is not in Kansas anymore. Can you explain why it's not in Kansas? Shucks, folks, I'm speechless. <laughs> I found this uh, professor here, Ed Mann, who is teaching at the University of Kansas, and... Uh, He's, he's been doing online learning for quite a few years, and I asked him the same question, and I've yet to get a response. Mom, okay. If e-learning is not in Kansas, then can we find it in St. Louis? Can we find it in Indiana? Where can we find it? Where are we going to find e-learning? Are we going to find it here in KD? Rich going to show us where the... 
faculty learning is? Well, the yellow brick road. The other faculties? Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick, follow the yellow brick, follow the yellow brick road. You want to see the wizard? Or what the wizard wants? Yeah, I'm not saying this is why I'm singing anymore. Okay. What technologies existed in 1955 to help and move us in this new direction towards e-learning? Many technologies came out back then. Let's take a look at now, back in good old 1955. Overhead projectors. In fact, at Indiana in the School of Ed, we had classes in overhead projector one and two that you could take. So you could label overhead projector if you need to. Erase from existence. Blackboards, right. Hey kids, what time is it? <laughs> Film strip projectors, digital multimedia back then, right? 1955 technologies. Fact. Next Saturday night. We're sending you back to the future. There's a special issue of Tech Trends magazine, which is brought to you by the School of Ed at Indiana. The editor is my department chair. In Tech Trends, a special issue in January 2006 talked about technologies of 50 years prior. Opaque projectors, film strip projectors, tape recorders, uh, phonographs, and so forth that kids might use and that overwhelmed instructors at the time. In 1955, instructors were overwhelmed with all these technologies. We complain today about the technologies overwhelming us. Podcasts, wikis, and blogs, oh my, e-learning is not in Kansas anymore. Technologies will continue to overwhelm us unless we figure out frameworks for logically categorizing them, reflecting on where they're best used, and not only thinking about technologies, but the corresponding nurture pedagogy that goes with nature, technology. They go hand in hand, right? So, today we walk into libraries like we have here at IUPUI, where I am this afternoon, or down in Bloomington. You walk inside the library, it doesn't look like the library of 10 or 20 years prior. Things have changed in college campuses today with technologies. We have to think about how to best utilize them in our classes, how to utilize the technologies students are coming to school with, coming to campus with, or coming virtually with their iPods, their cell phones, their PDAs of any kind. Uh, what is it, the laptops, tablet PCs, what are those technologies? How might we embed them in our classes effectively, thoughtfully, and somewhat thoroughly so that we can have more effective instruction, more exciting, engaging learning, and rejuvenate ourselves as instructors to think about what excites us, what gets people enamored, what gets people engaged, what gets people to stay within a class and succeed in the KD MBA program, right? 1985 technologies. Take a look at those for a second. What was it in 1985 that students were using? Okay, what is a gigawatt? Now, some of you might remember the early 80s and the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 Trash-80 computers that gave us that great power of 4K of RAM, the maximum 48K of RAM, which would basically hold one slide that I've got here for you today. So, powerful stuff, right? A lot more storage capacity in today's machines than we had back then. We had dual floppy drives, in fact. And if you wanted, in fact, um, those dual floppy drives, you're going to pay immensely for that, about $2,500 for the 32K drives that it came with. Anyways, as we moved on, process information, but only the information which is put into it. We had Commodore 64s. Now, how many of you had those Commodore 64s with twice as much memory as the Trash 80s did? 64K of RAM handles two of my PowerPoint slides today. 
Okay, how many of you had computers that looked like this? Now, I wanted a personal computer that looked almost like this one back in 1983 or 84 when I was an assistant controller of a company called Automated Systems. And my boss, Clarence, said, why would someone ever want a personal computer? He was a true blue IBM mainframe person. Now, Clarence every day would sharpen his same five pencils at 750 every morning and put them evenly spaced on his desk and pull out three neat stacks from his desk and plop them on the table. He was the controller. I was the system controller. He'd go to the bathroom at the exact same time every day, lunch the same time, put his coat in the same place. He wanted me to be like that. Didn't last too long as an accountant. But Clarence says, why would someone want a personal computer like this? And I would do all sorts of budget project projections in Lotus 1, 2, 3 and VisitCalc and other things and he'd put them in his desk drawer and hide them so no one would ever have access to see something that would actually be useful off a personal computer. And so the president never saw the sales projections and budgets that we were doing. Anyways, some of you might find uses of personal computers today that Clarence never dreamed of in 1983 and 84. Never send a human to do a machine's job. Okay, some of you might computer recognize that. Not judge. It makes logical selections. You might recognize Ataris and Pongs and Commodores and apples and so forth, and eventually Macintoshes, the technology of the 80s. We've come a long ways, baby, since the 80s. Maintenance note. My recording computer has a serious malfunction. Recommended either be corrected or, or scrapped. scrapped. Compute. Computed. Okay, apples and apple clones we all remember, Captain. right? Incoming message. In the 1990s technology. Now here's a technology that you've come to love or hate. If it's me, you hate it. Blackboard, WebCT, Encore, Sakai, you name it, Angel's better, of course. We won't talk about Angel. But what do these things give us? The 1990s course management systems. They let us track users, tell us how much they've been in the system, how long they've been in the system, and so forth and so on. Does this tell us anything about learning? Yes, they've got announcements. Yes, they've got discussion and chats, but discussions and chats that exist in WebCT existed before the course management systems. Chats and discussions were alive and well in the 1980s, early 1990s, well before Blackboard, WebCT, Encore, Sakai, and any other tools that you're using out there. These tools of the 1990s are warehousing students online. That's all they're doing. They're telling us students have been there and they've gone through the contents, they're getting degrees in electronic page turning, they're getting degrees in being able to move their eyeballs through screens. What we would need to do is engage learners and use technologies that are more interactive, more collaborative, more motivational. I contend here that the typical course management systems don't do that. We need something better. Black, uh, podcast wikis and blogs start us to reflect on what might be possible. Okay, so the technologies of the 90s. Technologies of the 2000s. We've got uh, cell phones being given away free at universities in New York. We've got laptop computers giving away free at Winona State Universities, tablet PCs. We've got Blackberries being given away to students in the MBA program at Maryland, your competitors there. We've got iPods being given away free at Duke and Drexel and other campuses to all freshmen. Unfortunately, they don't have plans on how to utilize the technologies they're given away. They're being used as incentives to bring students to campus. Put em up, put em up. We now have universities coming up with plans on how to integrate cell phones into their curricula so that students can get lecture notes and other things on their cell phones when they need it if they miss class. Bless the internet. Here's your students at Maryland using their Blackberries, right? Thinking about how to organize their lives, their schedules, and when they become managers and leaders, how to utilize these types of technologies to get decisions made fast and organize their day. Ouch! Now that hurts. We've got students at Duke here doing some uh, pulse indicators uh, uh, checking in, in using their iPods. We've got people here in Ohio. Lions and tigers up there. Oh my. Podcasts and wikis and blogs. Here's teachers in Ohio being given away iPods at the end of professional development. 
one afternoon session when I was there back in March of 2006. At the end of the session, they all got a free iPod. They had worked all day long from 7 in the morning at school till 3 in the afternoon and then came for more training in the afternoon. 9.30 at night, they rolled out the iPods and nobody wanted to go to bed. They had been working 14, 15 hours straight. It was a motivator. I wonder if the KD program is using iPods as a motivator here, maybe, to get some of the faculty to embed interesting things, podcasts, potentially within their classrooms. And those people that do, <clears throat> I'll make a little suggestion now, might get an iPod for their use or for innovations that are happening as a result of utilizing interesting, innovative technologies in their classrooms like the teachers were here. Technology is a way to get change in through the back door. It is a way to start to get people uh, thinking about change. It's an incentive. Total? It's intrinsic one. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Ah, e learning's not in Kansas anymore, is it? When you look at these technologies, it definitely is not. Okay. Effects of interactive multimedia on distance learning. Many articles have been written lately about the changes in distance learning. Universities and colleges are in the midst of a dramatic change, according to this quote, producing what may be the most challenging period in the history of higher education. Wow. We are teaching at a university that's pr pushing technology limits in an age when technology is changing and refashioning and transforming higher education. What a place to be at, Indiana. What a great place to work at, right? This is a time, a serendipitous time, and potentially for any faculty member to get a job here in Indiana. Now, again, it's the combination of technologies, pedagogies, and the third part I didn't mention earlier, the people, society, and culture that you're working in. It's an interactive model. We can't just think about technology. We have to consider the people using it as well as the pedagogical ways in which we're using that technology. The, um, Model shown here from Richard Mayer and Alan Pavio and others have, in the past looks at how we dual code information. Rich multimedia, visual and verbal, helps us remember things better. If we record things just verbally, we have less tracks in which to retrieve it from. It may be available, but not accessible. We want to make knowledge both available and accessible, hence rich multimedia in our classrooms. So combining words and pictures, what we hear and what we see, the sounds and the images combined together. Okay? That's more powerful. Combining animations and narrations, more powerful than just narrations alone or animations alone. Our verbal system specializes in words and sentences. Visual system specializes in images. We combine those two things together. We have more powerful learning capabilities. Richard Mayer from University of California, Santa Barbara, says that we have a multimedia effect when we learn. We can learn things more deeply from words and pictures than from words alone in both computer-based and book-based traditional environments. Coherence, when the pictures and the text are presented closely together, we learn better. Then, uh, and coherence effect when you have too much material, we get overwhelmed. When you have extraneous stuff, we don't remember things as well as when you have things more clearly defined for people. Spatial contiguity effect, which I kind of jumped ahead on, when we learn words placed near pictures, we learn content better. When words are placed near pictures, text placed near the animations that it's happening. Personalization, learning from a conversation as opposed from a boring didactic lecture but learning from stories. We learn better, both in traditional, face-to-face, -face, and online environments. Very interesting. Now, Richard Mayer's done a number of studies, and he's got a couple of books on this issue of learning through multimedia. And the reason I'm going through this first, before going to podcast wikis and blogs, is because I want to talk about this generation of learners for a little bit here. So we have a multimedia effect, a coherence effect, a spatial contiguity effect, and a personalization effect, which varies by the type of media that's involved. We use text and illustrations. It's, it's different from narration and animation. Anyways, he's laid all that out. 
uh, for us. But the point is, the overriding point, is when you combine media together, be it animations and narrations or text and illustrations, students will learn it better than if it's just text or just an illustration. Makes sense, but somebody had to do the research. There's lots of animation research out there that suggests and points to gaining attention and practice um, through animations, that points to emphasis through animations, that shows that graphics help show relationships, that dynamic displays of information are better than static ones. These things are all common sense duh findings, but again, someone had to do it so that people in the KD program can take that and embed it within the trainings here, right? We've got a difference between Gen Xers and baby boomers. We've got the baby boom generation who might be, might be, not always, might be hesitant, re reluctant, resistant towards technology. I can see you're really upset about this. I honestly think you ought to sit down calmly, take a stress pill, and think things over. Then we have the Gen Xers, Gen Y. Hot dog! They're more savvy with the technologies that are out there, right? They're coming wired, the young and the wired, not the young and the restless, the young and the wired. And so we have many people listening to their iPods, text messaging their friends simultaneously, right? There's also the Gen Y students, the millennial, neo-millennial students who are multitasking today in our classrooms, right? We've gone through a number of generations of students. Some are coming fully wired. It's no longer coming with one computer. They're coming with two computers to our college campuses. In fact, it says 81% are checking email. Emails in a recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed is looked to be as old technology. That's, that's old style. We use text messaging and other technologies. Instant messaging, blogs, PDAs, cell phones. Here it says 84% of students own a computer. I think now the number is up to 88% own at least one computer and uh, some like 28 to 30% own two or more computers and are bringing two or more to campus. Students are spending a Google amount of money on technologies. And we have to think about how to utilize those laptops and iPods and other kinds of things that they're bringing Library to class computer. with. Library Right? They're bringing their tablets. My son just started at Indiana. He may be a business student here soon. He hasn't decided, but he's got his new laptop computer he's bringing to every class. We've got students getting information on their handheld devices. Late night at Penn State and Georgetown universities and other places, Students can now check their schedules. Ball State, you can get up in the morning, check your schedule, see if any classes have been canceled. You can download information from classes. You can also order pizza. And in case of, I think it's Georgetown, order condoms with your pizza. But that's uh, something late night that only happens in Washington, D.C. and doesn't happen here in Indiana, I'm sure. Um, Penn State offering news service on their mobile devices so that students can keep abreast of what's going on on campus. So if your football team wins at the last second, like we did here in Indiana over Illinois <clears throat> this past weekend, you can get those updates immediately while you're having your pizza and whatnot. In Korea, they had an announcement recently where they're using their, um, their new PDA devices that they have there. They have their portable multimedia players in Korea where you can download lecture notes if you miss class. You can also in Korea have access to all the national uh, television stations videos that are available for all student access. So they're making lots of videos available free that could be used within a class. Uh, they have PMPs, per personal multimedia players, that's what they call them in Korea. Again, if a student misses a class, they can be on the train and download the notes and and learn it that way if they want to. Better technology in high schools raises students' expectations when they come to college. <clears throat> Two weeks ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there's an article about Ms. Kim here who says she expects, expects her instructors to use technology like smart boards and other things because her high school had them. The high school has them, certainly, this, this is her, she says certainly the university should have them, right? There's a student who says, 
I don't want to lug around a laptop on the campus at Northern Virginia, Virginia Community College because it's too heavy. So I'm going to have my little personal recording device here, handheld device. Here's a student who says, ah, I'm just going to, just going to design my own computer and have a, almost a supercomputer capacity uh, by designing my own technology. Students are coming to campus expecting us to use technologies. They're text messaging friends as they walk across campus. They're uh, checking the internet, checking their messages, updating their social networking sites in MySpace and Facebook and other places. They're ordering their train tickets online, their plane tickets, they're checking TV listings and sports. Last year I went for three months without watching television. Last year at this time I wasn't watching television. I tried getting all my news online. And the only time during the three months I actually had to go watch television was when I was in Kuala Lumpur and the hurricane had hit New Orleans and I needed to watch CNN to get real up-to-date information. Otherwise, I wouldn't have needed it. So here's a student sitting in an outdoor classroom, checking her notes, working outside. I've spent myself the last two months with a laptop sitting outside of my, my deck during my sabbatical and writing a book without, with a wireless connection. I could, I could be anywhere, sitting anywhere within that wireless access in a, in a bookstore, in a cafe, sitting at um, Starbucks, whatever, working wirelessly, not being connected. Now, instructors can be located anywhere in the world. I've taught from um, Iceland, I've taught from China, I've taught from the UK, I've taught from various places, I've taught from Abu Dhabi through video conferencing. We can be, as long as we have a connection, we can be teaching anywhere. Here's a student who says he prefers online classes. In fact, a study from South Dakota showed students preferred online classes to face-to-face -face ones, the first ever. This is something KD, KD should be jumping up and down about and telling the dean, hey, kids like online hey, learning, right? Are we online? Kids are coming with multiple computers, with gadgets, as I mentioned earlier. The baby boomer generation wa wanted and expected drill and kill, wanted to hear from the all-knowing instructor. They preferred less interaction than younger students do today. I thought I told you never to interrupt me while I'm working. That's the behaviorist model, turning a crank, getting feedback, extrinsic rewards, being taught, being told you've done well, and continuing to be to learn. The online PowerPoint, online electronic page turning, click, 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 that is learning, clicking through. To me, that's not learning. We can do better. We have many technologies today for animations, collaboration, group interactions, voice over the internet with Skype, various technologies that enable us to get more community-based, more interactive wikis, being the last one listed there, web meetings, um, so forth and so on. In fact, Adobe had a recent announcement where it said, hey, we can do better. You know, Adobe bought Macromedia because why? You go to the Macromedia website, you'll understand. Macromedia is an exciting, engaging, interesting place. We're studying blogging and announcements. In fact, at the Macromedia site, they have announcements and they have new products. And many companies do this today where they put part of the product up there and they have people download it and use it and give them feedback on it before they come up with the final version. Uh, the user group at Macromedia is an exciting, interesting kind of a place. Very interesting place, in fact. I'm going to have a student do a dissertation on it. It's so interesting to look at. Um, the honesty, uh, d the frankness that's displayed about the building of the products is amazing. But in addition to that, uh, they've got blog reflections from users all around the world. Well, Adobe bought out Macromedia because I heard Adobe's a boring company and they need an exciting company. And they're actually going to rename Breeze. I think Adobe um, Connect Pro is the name. I, I prefer Breeze. Anyways, if you go to this quote, you can see that Adobe wants to get more simulations, demonstrations, interactive quizzes, interactive multimedia, animations. They're looking to, to get more flashy ways to use Captivate online. They're going to have more branching within their online courses that they, that they help develop. Gen X students expect that. They expect interaction. They expect that community building. They expect immediate feedback. They're used to that immediate feedback. They expect rapid fire information. They 
consume much information. They maybe don't have short attention spans. They maybe are coping with the amount of information being sent to them in this world. The skill of the 21st century may not be the length of one's attention span, but being able to cope with Bonk's PowerPoints, no, being able to multitask can do many things well at one point in time. We have these Gen Y students entering the workplace, entering our college settings. The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. So here's a student. You can She's got her foot used her computer on the foot on the on the com her foot on the computer. Using it as a footstool. She's got her telephone. She's got her fax machine. She's got her television. She's got her stereo. She's got her um, cell phone sitting there. She's got 15 chats open simultaneously. And she's doing her, by the way, she's doing her homework all at the same time. The boomer, baby boomer, focuses on tell me what I need to know. Just tell me what I need to know. The Gen Xer wants options. Here's a couple of quotes. Online gives me something to do when I'm bored with a professor in a face-to-face -face setting. I respect myself more as a self-teacher than they do, in fact, their instructor. Students expect to be self-taught, expect to be trying things out. Students expect the to have a range of options within the class to learn according to their own learning preferences. Not learning styles, but their own learning preferences. The neo-millennial student is coming with skills in active, engaged learning, actively seeking out information, synthesizing information, nonlinear approaches to, to learning, learning through hypermedia, and then in fact producing products with other people in small teams, co-designing products. They're doing things like the kids at Duke here who have the freshman movie festivals at, that showcase what it's like to be a student at Duke. Okay? So you've got these freshman movie festivals happening at Duke. And uh, it's not just happening at Duke anymore, it's happening around the world where the students are making these multimedia movies and they have movie nights and they showcase what's, what their, their talents are. And I'll show you a couple pictures here. So you have these international film festivals from students using technology in schools in, in colleges and universities. Huge appeal to students today. You can actually go to the website and watch some movies. You can buy tickets and go to the shows. Campus Movie Fest. So we've got these neo-millennial, millennial students who are experts at playing games online, who are expecting personalized Barnes & Noble, Starbucks kinds of places in their computer labs so they can converse, not just go there to do their computing anymore, but to socialize, in effect, to have a place where you can do both. When I was in um, Glasgow last year, I had a tour of their new castle, a building they're building for students' learning and success. And they had built cafes wrapped around computer labs where students can get a pastry and have a discussion. And they were expecting and had seen in the previous lab built there at uh, Caledonian University, 200 students in a lab that had 80 computers. Why? Because students were coming to socialize as well as use the technology, both. So here we've got students who expect us to utilize our technologies, whatever they happen to be. And there are a number of technologies, among them podcasts and wikis and blogs. Let's take a look at blogs, podcasts, and wikis then. Blogs first. Six years ago, blogging was almost unheard of. 100,000 blogs among the 6 billion people on our planet. And by 2004, we're talking 10 million blogs. By 2005, 53 million blogs. USA Today said there are 75,000 blogs a day being created. 75,000 a day. Look at the growth in that curve there. There's a number of tools out there that have free blogging capabilities. Diaryland is a common one. Uh, Blogger, Blurty, MSN Spaces, LiveJournal, DeadJournal, all sorts of places are out there. Blogging, in fact, became the word of the year 
last year. Video blogging. Google bought Blogger and added video to it. You can have videos juxtaposed against the blog for richer multimedia learning, like what Richard Mayer talked about. And I mentioned Alan Pavio's dual coding theory earlier, video blogging. Blogging was the number one word last year. This year, it was podcast. You can turn your blogs into a book. You can become famous like this law professor in Tennessee has become famous at instapundent.com for his discussions about laws in Iraq and other things. You can become famous like this educator, Stephen Downs, who goes to every single conference on technology around the world and summarizes it for you in his blog so you don't have to go. Reads every technology magazine ever written so you don't have to read them. He's got a great blog called Stephen's Web. Another one is called Old Daily. He has two blogs. Will Richardson has a blog and actually has a, has a book on podcast wikis and blogs that recently came out. His blog is called We Blogged, whereas uh, Stephen Downs is more of a higher education blog. This one's more of a K-12 blog, but I pointed out anyways. Technorati is a, blog, um, is a resource to find blogs. You can find, if you have a blog, everybody who links to your blog, who have discussed your blog. So if you want to look up a blog, go to Technorati. You can also go into Google and do a blog search. If you're looking for blogs, you can find them in Google. Stephen Downs says, a blog is and has always been more than the offline equivalent of a personal journal. Though consisting of regular and often dated updates, the blog adds to the form of the diary by incorporating the best features of hypertext, the capacity to link new and useful resources. But a blog is always characterized by its reflection of a personal style. And the style may be reflected in either the writers or the selection of links passed along to readers. The blogs are, in their purest form, the core of what's been called personal publishing. So what's he saying here is that we've got a diary, yes, but we've also got links within that diary. We've got our pushing of, of our readers to other resources. We've got hypertext. We've got links. So we've got multiple things that are happening within a blog. So we might have connections to pictures and other reflections. We might have a video juxtaposed against it. We're publishing our ideas, but we're publishing links to other people's ideas as well at the same time. Linda Everts says that weblogs, blogs for short, are the surprise wedding of informational capacity of journalism and the speed of instant messaging composed of short and frequently updated postings arranged in a chronological order. Blogs are websites similar to online journals offering information on topics ranging from foreign policy to poetry. Brandon Hall, who has the annual Brandon Hall Awards and does research on e-learning, says a blog is a web journal containing dated entries on a given topic or scheme. They include search, feedback from readers, links to other sites, they can be written by one person or a group. Blogs can be used to share a viewpoint, enable collaborative discussion, present new up product ideas, or explain ongoing news and changes. So now you should have some definitions for what blogs are. If you did, came into the session without knowing what a blog was, you now have three different definitions, Downs, Efforts, and Brandon Hall's viewpoints on what a blog is. So a blog is reflection on maybe what you've read in a class within the KD program. It can also be a connection to other people and their ideas. It can be an individual affair, and it can be a collaborative one. So you could have possibilities for either, or in fact, both taking place. You could have a collaboration taking place across a number of individual blogs. And so that's what I have my students do sometimes and give each other feedback. It's not just a diary, but you have places to give feedback in most blogs. Tips on setting up a blog. Here are some simple ones. A creative title does help. Uh, taking a look at the blog tools and systems to see whether or not you have the capabilities that you want. Try it out. Try it out and then share it. Now there are professional blogs out there, educational instructor blogs to share course information as well as student blogs to reflect on classes and communicate their group work. You might have an instructor blog that summarizes a class. You might have learners blog on what they've done in a class. You might have learners give feedback to each other on their blogs. You might have a class create a group blog on what's going on in a class. 
you might have students corresponding with other students around the world on their blogs. You might have students do reflection papers on their blogs, blogs on blogs, revise their blogs or blog postings, or expand on a blog posting into a longer paper. So a couple of pedagogical ideas here, and I use many of them. One of the things that comes in handy is the blog on blog. I don't grade all their blogs. I grade their summaries of their blogs. They're super summaries of what they've learned in my class. They have peer feedback. They have critical friends who give them feedback on their blogs each week that get them pushed on their thinking or push them on their thinking. So they have reflections on their blogs, blogs on blogs, but they also have summaries and they have peer feedbacks potentially on their blogs. Again, I only grade, typically, their blog summaries. I might also give them feedback intermittently on what they've blog posted, but if I have them read 30 articles and summarize them in a blog and I have 20 students in class, that's 600 postings and there's no way I can give feedback on all 600. So what I do is I have a critical friend give feedback every week on those postings. So here's my blog, Traveling Ed Man, and you can read my own my students blogs. Actually, oh, here's my I'm Traveling a Ed. Failure Man. because I haven't got a brain. Well, what would what would you do with a brain if you had one? Students blogging on me. Oh, sure. I got a brain. How can I ever thank you enough? Well, you can't. Here I have a student who blogged He's a former student I had in class four or five years ago. He's now teaching art in Shelbyville. What was interesting about this blog is he introduced himself and the course in this blog, but then he put a posting in there about a student who had come from Scotland and had hoped that his class would have a chance to correspond with the students in Scotland. And he sent me an email about this. He said, Kurt, could you maybe give feedback to us on this blog post? Where was I at the time? This was about five weeks ago. I was in Scotland, exactly where he wanted a, a, a response to come from. It wasn't coming from a student to respond to one of his students who had posted about living in Scotland his whole life and now had moved to Indiana. But I happened to be in Scotland, so it was serendipitous uh, that that happened. But here was power, collaboration around the world, wherever you happen to be, and giving feedback from an expert, potentially, Maybe not me being an expert, but potentially getting experts from someone around the world on a blog post. You have many choices for blogging tools. I've listed some earlier. Here's some more. Movable type I didn't mention earlier, but it's one of the few I think you have to pay for. In Korea, they have social networking software and blogs called SciWorlds. Everyone, every kid in Korea has a SciWorld website matched up to their, in effect, their social security number, so you can't be fictitious, but it's exploding. SciWorlds is coming to the U.S. I'm only pointing it out because you might hear about SciWorlds in the not too distant future. It's going to be a big push in the SciWorld site. Remember, Korea is the one place in the world that has the most uh, broadband access, the most people connected to the internet around the world, where people actually play games so much that they die uh, at their workstations. The guy who got divorced in the following week, he died at his workstation and so forth. But anyways, Korea is an interesting place. Why are we using blogs? What do people put up there? Well, they put personal life, politics, news, business, religion. I don't see education in there anywhere, but even if it's just 1% of things are educational of those 53 million blogs, there's many educational blogs that you might reference your students to. Many places you can go to learn. Bloggers blog because they want to share personal experiences, share things they're passionate about. They like to write and they have full-time jobs doing something else. They're not making money at this. They're primarily ages 18 to 30. They're not typically publishing lots of things outside of their blogs. They typically remain anonymous, and so they spend many hours doing their blogs. Some of them post business blogs, some post personal blogs. This student here posted a personal blog in my class, used the blog to as a sounding board to write to a conference and got his paper accepted <clears throat> and got flown to the conference. His blog was so good about e-learning in Thailand that they flew him to the conference, gave him full accommodations and so forth. As a result of the blog, he had posted a white paper he had written in his blog about where e-learning in Thailand could go. An international conference picked it up and brought him there. So blogs have an educational means as well. You have business blogs, people blogging on what businesses are doing, 
<clears throat> this is the Blogger website. You can take a look at Blogger and other tools. A couple of years ago, Perseus Software did a study of bloggers and found more females than males were blogging, although that might not be the case anymore. And most people were ages 13 to 30. Now we've got video juxtaposed against one's blog so that we can have a text and a video. Again, more powerful learning can take place watching the video juxtaposed against the text, watching something in action, and then reading about it. Blogs are exploding in America. Blogs are happening in the workplace, so much so that some people could get fired. Okay, so you might put something in your blog that could get you in trouble, and I speak from experience. You might have employers catching what people do on their web logs and then writing notes, as this individual did here. He got an email, said you're fired, da 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 da. <clears throat> we might have blogs on online discussions. So here we have an event with Sir Richard Branson from Virgin Air Airlines. And we've got people blogging on this online event wrapped around this conference or discussion with Richard Branson. We have businesses who create blogs just to get noticed. In USA Today, a week and a half ago, back um, a couple of weeks back, they had a special issue on businesses that put up their blogs, like this biking business that put up special information about events that they endorsed or held and maps and information on bikes and all sorts of things that their customers might gather. Another business here, a real estate business, said, ah, we read the USA Today article the day I went there and he said, welcome USA Today readers. They knew people would be reading the USA article and linking to their website. So they had a blog on buying real estate in the area. Wikis, trend number two. Again, we're going to go through podcasts, wikis, and blogs. Wikis is the second one. This individual here's name and the top of your screen, his name is Jimmy Wales. Jimmy Wales might be familiar to some of you in the KD program. My understanding is that Jimmy dropped out of the graduate program at IU Business School to start Wikipedia. I'm not sure if many of you had him in class or if he was a good student or not, but we're all excited by Wikipedia, I think, as it's become one of the top 20 websites used around the world. People are becoming contributors to Wikipedia. People are becoming users of it. Many people are becoming critics of it. We're currently doing a study of people who develop wiki books online, and I'm going to show you some data on our wiki book studies. Anyways, wikis is an exciting kind of an area. Electronic books in general, as devices have become thinner in nature, more transportable, we've got more text being put up onto the internet that we can access. Wikipedia, people said it would never work. Now it's available in many languages with millions of documents. You can hyperlink within Wikipedia, so it's not a static encyclopedia. You can click to other pages. <clears throat> One of my colleagues is utilize, utilizing it a lot, looking up um, information on the Catholic religion which you couldn't get in the Catholic encyclopedias, which were 100 years old, that he had been using. He found the Wikipedia information exciting from a couple of standpoints. And this is from a person who I wouldn't have thought to be a user of wikis or Wikipedia. He said, well, I can connect to things, hyperlink to things fast, and the data is up to date. Information is more current than I got out of my 100-year-old encyclopedias. So you can click on things and get to different things within Wikipedia. They not only have Wikipedia, but now you have wiki species to find out about species of the world, wiki books, books that have been published, wiki commons for different information resources, uh, so forth and so on. Wiktionary, online dictionary, wiki university, all sorts of websites out there. So Wiktionary, you can find out synonyms, antonyms, pronunciations of different words, definitions of words. You can see how um, the uh, derivations of different words. You can see that the Wikipedia Foundation makes money through donations, about $300,000 a month, according to this little chart here. They're willing to take your money, too, if you want to send them some. Now, <clears throat> Wikipedia was started by two people, and Jimmy Wales is one. His colleague has created something, or is in the midst of creating something, called Digital Universe. He doesn't believe that 
Wikipedia has good peer review. And so he's trying to create PBS quality resources online, and these be video resources. So you can go to Digital Universe at some point, it's not available yet, and get video resources on nanotechnology and space and biotechnology and so forth that you might be able to access and use in your classes. One thing that you need to be thinking about in KD is video resources. How we can access them and utilize them in your classes, things that are available free. Brandon Hall defines wiki. Remember we got his definition earlier on podcast or on blogging. We'll get his podcast one next. Wiki, according to Brandon, is a collection of web pages that can be easily viewed and modified by anyone, providing a means for sharing, learning, and collaboration. So it's a collaborative tool. It's a sharing tool. It's a tool that can be modif modifying contents. It's a writing tool, in effect. Brandon goes on and says, a wiki can be used to create content on the fly. Sort of like a blog. You can create content on the fly, right? As a repository for information, and for archiving group learning. Benefits include speed, simplicity, sense of ownership among participants. So you've got this, this sense of fast content being put up online and easy to use tools. I don't necessarily agree about the ownership point, but we'll go on to the third part of his definition. He says teams use them to track virtual team members, provide information about their roles, discuss project processes, share knowledge and insights. Benefits include ease of collaboration, editing, and access. So it's a collaborative tool, it's an editing tool, it's an access tool. Ownership, people in the blogging community feels no one owns, a, a, or in the wiki community feels no one owns a wiki, no one owns the content. I'm not sure about ownership yet. For teachers new to wikis, wikis are free online writing spaces. They're simple to use. You don't need to know HTML formatting, they're collaborative endeavors that more than one person can write to them and edit them and change them. They have a history that you can scroll back to if you, people put things in there you don't like or that's incorrect or are misconceptions. They're published online. Again, people don't claim ownership necessarily, and they have a history. Wikis are a writing space for people to edit, build on, assume some power, permissions. How are they used in teaching? Wikis can be a space for groups to collaborate, a place to debate ideas, a place to post your personal writings, free writings, new ideas, a, pers a place to watch how groups correspond with one another and collaborate with each other, a place to revise and edit. As I mentioned, there are many wiki resources, and these will continue to grow. Wiki books, Wiktionary, Wikiversity, free online university or resources for a university. Wiki quotes, news, species. What does wiki mean? Wiki in Hawaiian means quick. And um, when Ward Cunningham had been in Hawaii, he was asking for directions to get someone, get somewhere fast, and they told, they told him to take the wiki wiki, which meant quick quick, the quick little bus route that he needed to take. And so wiki was a, a term that stuck with him. It also means what I know is, W-I-K-I, what I know is. It's an interactive classroom space, a collaborative space. So here's Ward Cunningham, who developed the first wiki and is now a prominent keynote at many places, uh, technology conferences. You might recognize Ward potentially. This is a screen from a wiki history site, so you can see who's made changes in the wiki and what dates the changes have been made and scroll back to them. Wiki software might be free PHP based uh, with a MySQL database or it might be Perl based or Java based or many software systems that it runs on. There are many wiki tools, the media wiki being the one that I'm using currently. There are many decisions about the wiki, about access and control about permissions. Some you can have password protections built into the system so that you can have both private and public kinds of wikis. You, some have advanced capabilities for spell checking and blogging and polling and calendaring and emoticons. At the Wikibooks website, you'll find over a thousand books, over 12,000 chapters, 
on topics such as German and Spanish and Portuguese language topics, or history or economics, or civil war or whatever, free books that people have written, and junior books for high school and middle school kids. Books are organized by modules or chapters. So if you click on a particular chapter or module, and here's a book on blended learning in K-12 education, that's free. So if you don't want to buy my handbook of blended learning, you can get the free one at Wikibooks. So you click through and you read the different chapters that have been produced by someone, whether it be a physics book or a geometry book or whatever it happens to be. This list that the individual is holding here is a list of all the people who have written a, bi a wiki book or have been involved in the wiki, uh, Wikipedia project. All the names of contributors, thousands and thousands of people. <clears throat> now there's over a thousand books. They have an alphabetic listing. In the B's you can get books on bicycles, bodybuilding, beauticians, uh, botany, the Beatles. Now faculty are starting to look at this notion of online books. College instructors are starting to, to utilize wiki-like resources to put their books on the web and to get feedback from people around the world on those books, to get ideas, to share those ideas that are embedded in their online book. So book 2.0, some people take those ideas and then change their book around based on those ideas. Some people take those ideas, change their book, and in fact keep the book online, downloadable, either free or for a price. Some people just utilize that for the feedback and then still have a paper-based book that's produced as a result. Now I said we've done a lot of research on wikis, <coughs> and as you can see here, the age of people creating wikis is under age uh, 25, is more than half, more than 60% of people are under age 25, uh, more than 80% are under age 35. Most are males. We've studied um, 75, 80, I think it's 80 Wikibookians, and actually our new numbers are 97%, not much change, but only 3% of those 80 were females. Many didn't have college degrees, about half had two year college or less. <clears throat> Many had been involved in creating Wikipedia resources prior to being involved in Wikibooks. So they had experience out there in using some of these tools. Many had been uh, interested in using the Wiki tool as a, as a tool for sharing knowledge, as a tool for uh, utilizing, uh, as a way to utilize current technology, but really they were, they were inspired because they want to share, they want to help society out, they want to explore what's possible. They most feel they were successful, about a quarter percent feels though that the Wikibook project was not successful. <clears throat> most feels though no one owns the book. Some feels though the editors, the users, uh, the contributors all own the book, but most feels though nobody owns the book. Most feels though they can complete the book, but not all. Now here we've got my class creating a wiki. Students go in <coughs> to the wiki site. They have a, it's password protected. They have a space there for sharing information, sharing feedback with one another. They can see who are part of the class, who are the collaborative teams, who we've linked together. They can see the feedback that students give to each other on their projects. They can see topics that different students select to write on. They can see chapters they've written. Third technology, podcasting. So we've gone through blogs, we've gone through wikis, now we'll go through podcasts. What is a podcast? Any questions out there so far? My virtual group out here. Well, what is a podcast? A podcast is like a radio show, right? Like holding an online radio show. When I have a podcast, and, or do a podcast, I typically write down three or four or five questions that are unique for the chapter that we're covering or the contents that we're going through. And then I have a colleague who goes through and acts as a host for the podcast. He sits next to me. His name's Chris. And Chris does the podcast with me. He asks me the questions and I answer them. Typically, 10 minutes 
15 max, but about 10 minute podcast, maybe five minutes. Basically, the podcasts, the way we do it, are short updates on a class. They're discussing what controversies exist in the topics that they're going to read about, what current news might be out there, maybe as a hook into the current news or something that's happened recently, maybe something controversial that's going on, and so forth. So podcasts typically are not a full lecture, although they might be, <clears throat> at least the way I'm using it. I know Purdue is taping all their class lectures and making them available as podcasts, and IU is pushing in that direction it is as well. Friday. It's August this individual 26, here, 2005. you might recognize. Hello, everybody. How you doing? His name is Adam Curry. Now, Adam was a VJ on MTV back in the early days of MTV. He was one of the first Napster types of people before Napster came out. He was sharing music online. Adam's an interesting guy. He's one of the most famous podcasters in the world from Guildford, England, south of London, where he produces his podcast shows. He's also helping kids around the world put up their podcasts. Here's Adam's studio. So you can see what he has available in this iPod producing studio. Here's some of his uh, website and music you can click and download. So nice to see, though, that everyone's amazed that Patricia let me have this thing uh, up in the office. Well, of course, this is uh, how I uh, make a living. <laughs> but yeah, it won't be too long before she either wants to repaint it or wants to put curly wood bits on it. Maybe we should go find some of those curly wood bits. Okay, so now we've got the age of audio. We've got the guy here on the left listening to a book. Instead of reading a book, I now listen to books in my car. I don't buy books typically or much anymore or read them. I, I listen to them. We now have conferences where people go to where instead of having keynotes, they have audio devices that record famous people at the conference, and then they make those available for other people at the conference. They interview people at the conference. Interesting. Here's a conference called Learning, or, yeah, run by Elliot Maisie, where he gives away audio devices for people to create their own keynotes. It's held in Orlando typically every year. Um, we now have professors like this one putting their lecture notes up online and some people worried, well, if the students don't come to class, they won't learn anything. Well, if they can get everything off the pod podcast, why should they come to class? What's so magical about coming to class if they can learn in that way? It's about learning. It's not about place where that learning occurs. It's about learning and helping people learn. It's not about the time people learn. What we need to be concerned about is the possibilities for learning, creating unique spaces for learning. And podcasts are that are one type of space for learning, one possibility for learning. We're no longer time dependent, space dependent. It's now time and space independent. We no longer confined or constrained to eyeball to eyeball. We now can put things up in podcasts and other types of technologies, video streams, and so forth to enable learners, any type of learner, to learn. It's about learning. It's about access. It's about capabilities. It's about possibilities. And we all have that possibility now with podcasts to make lectures available. And so what if they don't come to class? Is your class not that interesting that they need to come to class? <clears throat> now, I know I might get a nasty email or two about that. But in fact, students typically who get podcasts still come to class. It's not an overriding concern, typically. Okay? But you're making that resource available for students that can be replayed. What about the student who goes to the PowerPoints that have been streamed or the video podcast that's been put up and watches it even though they went to class? What about the people who do both? Why are people always concerned about the people who skip out on learning? Why don't we be more concerned about the people who engage in learning and work with them. Why don't we work with people who want an education? Well, I should go on. Okay, so we've got students who are downloading complete lectures and concerns about that, right? We've got kids who are producing their own podcast shows and making them available to other people around the world. Parents can now find out what kids are doing in schools, actually, right? We've got the Cooley Kids podcast, very famous podcast that's ma been made available. So. Uh, people, kids are becoming well known around the world for their podcasts, their newscasts. We've got teachers getting upgraded skills in their podcasts, maybe professionals in the field in the school, in the business school. We've now got Stephen Jobs who wants your iPod available in your living room so you can watch all sorts of videos and be connected to your iPod constantly. We have to think about 
utilizing these podcast technologies better. Podcasts can provide a way, according to Brandon Hall, a way to distribute an audio or video episode via the internet for playback at any time on any MP3 device or PC. Podcasts allow training in the form of an event capture, new product information, sales tips, orientations to be delivered on a just-in-time, just enough to anyone, anywhere. Wow! Amazing! So here we've got possibilities for sharing information to anyone, anywhere in the world on any topic, just in time, just enough. You can turn it off when you don't need it anymore. So it's a technology that should have reams and reams of educational uses. We should be thinking about how to use it in KD. How are we using podcasting? Where can we use podcasting? And how can we test the effectiveness of it? And how can we reuse those learning resources those objects, those podcasts, in another class or share them maybe with another university somewhere in the world and collaboratively build and maintain them. Now we can get lectures on the fly to handheld devices thanks to uh, technologies like ComView, mobile, so that you can give your lectures at a beach in Florida and immediately it goes onto a website or as you, before you enter a plane or when you're on a plane if you have an internet connection and students can download it today. Think about what's possible in 10 years or 20 years. Nielsen net ratings announced 6.6% .6 of U.S. population or 9 million users have recently downloaded a podcast. 4% or 5 million uh, have downloaded a video podcast. Those numbers put it on par with publishing blogs uh, and online daters. However, podcasting is not caught up to paying bills online or job hunting. Interesting. Fingertip knowledge. Fingertip knowledge. One of uh, Elliot Maisie's focus these days is fingertip knowledge. He says um, colleagues are increasingly using search engines from Google and intranets uh, to walk uh, away with information that they need, to find information on the fly, just in time. Fingertip knowledge. We no longer need to memorize information, according to Maisie. We no longer need to, to have every concept learned. We can find that concept that we need. The more important skill according to him, then uh, memorization of times and dates is being able to find those times and dates or pieces of information when we need it. The skill of search, browse, evaluate, critically evaluate it, analyze it, using finding re reliable resources, credible resources. Elliot Macy has Learning 2006 happening. I had Learning 2005 earlier up there where he talks about fingertip knowledge, learning in a flatter world. The learning world has become flat. Mobile technologies, the sharing of online contents, free online resources, online learning, the KD program, Google, searching for information, uh, blogs, podcasts, wikis, have all flattened the world of learning. So everybody has access to learning today, right? We now have uh, podcasts taking place in schools as I had up earlier, and yet school systems are outlawing them. They're saying, okay, flip-flops are fine, but no, iPods, please. Schools aren't understanding the power of education, are they? Hopefully the KD program is. We now have World Bridges, a network of individuals and organizations that use live, interactive webcasting and other media to help people connect, learn, and collaborate. The Webheads group, the international ESL group called Webheads, have all sorts of live podcast, webcast events through World Bridges. The global goal of World Bridges is to foster understanding and cooperations of citizens on the planet, respect, and open source collaboration, sense of world identity. So you can now go to World Bridges and download many of these webcasts that have been done. Just click through. You can find things on different topics, including uh, jobs in Korea, whatever it is. Here we've got the Dalai Lama. Unfortunately, I can't understand the Dalai Lama because I don't speak the language, so we'll move on. We have Boilercast from Purdue, and I think they speak English up there in Lafayette, up at Purdue. And so I could understand these files if I downloaded Boilercast, the podcast for all their courses. They have a podcast connected to all their classes at IU. There's an announcement two months ago about podcasts being used at IU. 
As I said earlier, we've got kids in schools doing podcasts. This rap about the zebra mussels. What's that? The zebra mussels are part of a bonding ecosystem. When they die, we won't miss it. You see, such a mussel should be scraped out so the river can be smooth and sound. Before you go into a different river, wash off your boat and maybe bring a nice coat. The population of the fish are going down because the zebra mussels are all around. Zebra mussel! Got kids doing uh, video, uh, audio streaming online. This, these guys are a little better singers, aren't they? Got a little Joan Jet happening online. Yeah, me singing, I love rock and roll. I love. Come on, sing it with me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we also have Chinese Pod. Chinese Pod is an interesting website, right? I don't know how many of you have been to Chinese Pod. But uh, if you've been to Chinese Pod, raise your hand. I'll call on one of you. Now, Chinese Pod is an interesting website. Hi, I'm Ken Carroll. Hi, I'm Jenny Chu. www.chinesepod.com. This is Chinese Pod. There's Ken Carroll and Jenny from Chinese Pod. You have different topics at Chinese Pod to learn Mandarin. Topics like um, oh, tea and culture and dating and transportation and shopping and all sorts of things are available at Chinese Pod. It's an interesting website. Language learning is a growing area online because of the capabilities of audio. You can download, you can actually have practice exercises, so you can try things out. There are actually at Chinese Pod, they have a wiki and a blog, and they have podcasts. They have all three technologies built at um, Chinese Pod. There's now other websites, Chinese Pod or Japanese Pod, and other, other um, languages are being taught online to um, kind of simulate what's happening here. It's a very popular website for learning Mandarin. So you've got this lesson on tea from Great Jenny. Teachers in your pocket, excellent resources on the web. Now, did you hear what he said there? Great teachers, uh, excellent teachers in your pocket. Great teachers in your pocket, excellent resources on the web. Okay? That teacher in your pocket is your iPod. Listen to it again. Great teachers in your pocket, excellent resources on the website. Learn Mandarin with Chinese Pod. Hello, welcome to Chinese Pod, bringing you the most valuable, interesting, and authentic Chinese from Shanghai. I'm Jenny, and uh, our advanced shows really have received a lot of. Okay, and they also have videos showing how language is used in the real world. So you can watch a video and see how it's used or misused. Okay? Uh, they also have been featured on CNN. There was a recent video last month that talked about Chinese pod. Uh, and so you can go download and, and, re and actually watch uh, Ken and Jenny in that free video that's available online. Some students are learning Arabic online through their iPods and video-based lessons as well as audio lessons and uh, text. Stanford uh, has their lectures up online. If you could never afford to go to Stanford, you can now go to this website and iTunes in, and Berkeley as well, have their course contents available online so you can listen to different uh, lecturers from Stanford free online. Here's Berkeley's. So, podcast should be short to the point, not loaded with URLs, be fairly friendly and informal, conversational in nature. When Chris and I do our podcast, we're very interactional. You have to write a script, arrange for the interviews, collect images and sound clips that you might use, collect your URLs, and then get to the recording devices, record your podcasts. Now, there are many portals out there that collect podcasts, and many have educational podcasts that you can download and use. Take a look and see what's available in your class. You might be able to use some existing podcast materials. Go to podcast.net. Find educational resources there. Podcast Alley is another one you might go to. The Education Podcast Network for K-12 education has a number of podcasts that are available in the K-12 space for elementary, middle, and high school kids. There are a number of applications of podcasts, giving lectures online, interviews online, 
downloading students' performances, recordings, supplementing textbooks, so forth and so on, many types of resources available. This is a podcast we did in the school event to teach people how to do a podcast. My colleague Chris Essex goes in here and explains uh, what a podcast is. He's on episode 12 now, I believe. He's done 12 or 13 podcasts on how to do a podcast that our School of Ed now can have access to. The KD program might develop something similar. We have podcast explanations and descriptions and examples. And here comes Chris to explain Welcome it. Welcome back. This is Teach with Tech, and I'm Chris Essex from the Indiana University School of Education the Structural Consulting Office. We made it here to episode seven. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. And there's Chris, and there's me, and uh, probably my, my iPod in Israel trying to do a podcast from there, and Chris and I doing our interactive session uh, on uh, chapter six of my book in educational psychology or learning theories. Well, welcome. This is uh, Bonkcast 2, our second podcast in the uh, Bonk Educational Psychology Network here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Piaget and Vygotsky. Vygotsky, how do you say that? Yeah, it's Vygotsky. Very good, Chris. Um, yes. You're the man. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I can't pronounce it. He's Russian, right, Vygotsky? He certainly is. Yeah. Can we banter back and hey, forth doc, a little bit in that? Hey, Doc, we don't have enough roads to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going. We don't need roads. So where are we headed? What technologies are coming next? What will be well beyond podcast wikis and blogs? What will you be asking me to talk about next year, a year and a half when I come back? Hopefully you'll invite me back. Don't execute me after this poor performance here today. Uh, <laughs> bonk. Anyways, hopefully you can find ways to use podcast wikis and blogs in your own classrooms. Hopefully you've been thinking about as you watch this particular program what you've been doing, maybe what your colleagues have been doing, and can in fact share with each other some ideas and share some with me so I can use them as well. But create a community of podcast wikis and blog and people here in KD. Maybe extend that community beyond KD somehow. Uh, find other ways, uh, other technologies you might link beyond podcast wikis and blogs. What else might you utilize? Where are we going? And what does this all mean? I think it means, as I mentioned in an earlier program I did with you on blended learning, that students are going to be assuming more responsibility for learning. Things will become more community-based and collaborative in nature and expectations for real-world experiences, hands-on simulations as well, are going to grow. And we need to keep thinking thoughtfully on how we integrate technology, not haphazardly just using a podcast, wiki, or blog just because it happens to be possible, but to think about logically why we need to use it. So, and where it's most used most effectively, of course, right? And maybe we can collaborate, you and I, on something down the road. I hope that's possible, or at least I get to talk to some of you and interview some of you about what you're doing in future research within the KD program. I want to thank Rich Majuka for inviting me in to do two, a second talk for you. In the spring, I'll be coming, I think, January, late January, to do a live presentation on blended learning, as well as this session on podcast wikis and blogs. They'll be replicated in a live forum, so if you want to repeat this or if you want a colleague to watch it in a live fashion, I'll be doing that as well sometime, actually, in, during the early part of the spring term in late January, I believe, of 2007. If you're watching this particular show uh, down the road in 2008 or 9, you'll have to ask me to come back. Let me end with a couple of pictures and quotes, questions and answers. Are you ready now? Are you ready now? Yes. Podcast, wikis, and blogs on my e-learning is not in Kansas anymore. Can it go to KD? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready now. She's ready. Close Are you ready? Eyes. Close your eyes. Tap your heels together. Tap your heels. Three times. Think about where Katie's going. And think to yourself. There's, there's no, no place, place like Katie. Like there's, no there's no place, place like Katie. There's, there's no place like Katie. There's no place like Katie. Like like See you in the future. See you all in the future. You mean the past. Exactly. The force will be with you. May the force be with always. you always. Thank you again for coming to this session. I hope you got a lot. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present, and I'm always available by email. cjbonk at indiana.edu, School of Education, IST Department, room 2238, 
happy to answer to any questions um, or phone calls. Thank you again.